Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville, and it is absolutely beautiful this spring. We're in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts, in the shadow of the great Blue Hills. We just love it here. And we just love that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Thank you so very much. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is the founder of the Bay Area Children's Theater. Her name is Nina Meehan, and we'll be celebrating creative parenting. Before we invite Nina into the studio, we want to invite you to our first live podcast recording. That's right, the Reading With Your Kids podcast will be recording a, a, an interview live with Dr. Regine Moradian. She'll be here to help us best help our kids cope with the anxiety they may be feeling with the, the, the reopening of the world. You know, all of us have been so looking forward to when we could get back to some, some kind of normal, to walk around without masks, to give our friends hugs, to, to be able to sit down and listen to live music together. And, and, and it's happening now. And as happy as everybody is, people are still a little bit worried. Your kid could be one of those people. And that's okay. And Dr. Regine is going to let us know how we can help our kids cope with that anxiety and probably also help us cope with whatever anxiety we may be feeling. You do need tickets to attend the event. It's a virtual event. Uh, you can attend from wherever you are around the world. It's happening June 4th, 2021, 2 p.m. Eastern time. I have no idea what that is in your time. It's pretty easy to figure out. If you go to our website, uh, readingwithyourkids.com, you can click on our event bright link to get your tickets. It's Dr. Regine Moravian. She'll be live, a live podcast recording June 4th, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Tickets are free and they're available now. Join us right now from the San Francisco area in California. Our guest is the founder and director of the Bay Area Children's Theater. Please welcome to the show, Nina Meehan. Nina, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to have you on. Nina and I are going to be talking about creative parenting. We're going to be talking about story. She's been adapting children's books for musicals for years now. Why don't we begin by you giving us a little um, uh, uh, taste of, of what the Bay Area Children's Theater is and, and what you've been doing for your community. Absolutely. So Bay Area Children's Theater was founded 18 years ago with me and four friends who all got together. We had all studied children's theater in college and we were all arts educators and performers doing educational theater tours. And we said, you know, why isn't there a really amazing children's theater company here in the Bay Area like there is in Seattle and Minneapolis and Phoenix? So we did that thing where you're young and get together and say, let's make a company. And 18 years later, we've reached over 700,000 kids and adults with our shows. And it's kind of incredible when I really think about it. It, it really is. And I know myself uh, doing educational magic shows and, and performing at family events and, and whatnot for over 30 years. It's, um, it's amazing. And it's such a blessing. Um, there's nothing. And, and, I know now that there's nothing like performing in front of a live audience because I haven't been able to do it for a year. I miss it so much. We miss it too. We miss it so much, but you know, we're doing our best. And uh, I love what you're saying about performing for kids. I always tell my actors on the very first rehearsal, if they've never performed for kids before, I say to them, you guys got to understand that an audience of kids is going to be your most honest, brutal audience you will ever perform for. You do a show for adults, the show ends, they will clap. It does not matter if it was brilliant. It does not matter if it was terrible. They will still clap. But for kids, if they're bored, they'll just tell you, mm -hmm. I'm bored, you'll hear from the front row. You know? 
I've heard worse from the front row. <laughs> and from a very young child, too. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> How do you know that word? I'm <laughs> But you're right. You're right. Performing for kids is it's it's its own animal. It's uh, it's it's honest. They are honest. They'll let you know um, that, you know, they, they'll let you know when they're bored. But the other thing is when you when you have them, when you get their attention, there's nothing else like it. You know, you can grab uh, an, uh, an adult audience's attention and hold it. But, you know, you most of the, you know, in the back of their mind, they're still thinking about the job or whatnot. But kids, boy, when you have them, they are there with you, laser focused in. Yes, they are all in. And there is nothing I love more than to you know show up at our theater on a Tuesday morning when we have a packed house with student matinees and watching all these kids leaning forward, eyes popping engaging with the stories you can literally it's almost like you can actually see a bubble above their head of their like the creative imagination juices like processing and i love that feeling of that communal experience yeah now we have obviously we've had hundreds and hundreds of authors here on the show and a lot of children's and one of the things we've talked about is that writing children's stories are it can be very difficult because there's such a limited number of words that you can use. And so most children's stories, unless you're talking about a, a you know, an extensive novel, but, but most chapter books and, 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 and picture books are short reads. They're, they're 15, 20 minutes, you know, and so they're designed for right before bed. I'm imagining adapting that type of story into a theater experience that has to be longer. That must be a, quite a challenge for you. It is quite a challenge, and we, I, I produce, I direct, and I write, um, but I also work with a tremendous number of amazing collaborators who are also writers and composers. And, um, you know, we love taking a story, honoring the author's intent, and then expanding on it, you know, doing what we can to add in additional elements and music to take absolutely everything the author wanted, but figuring out how to find the playable moments, the action moments, what can we bring to life with even more depth because we're working in the modality of theater. Was there one story that stands out that was most challenging for you to, to adapt? I'm going to go with, there's two actually. Okay. So I have a, a love of giving myself crazy challenges of working with our resident playwright and composer, Austin Zumbro, to adapt books that have no plot. So two examples of that, Barney Salzberg's Beautiful Oops and Hervé Tulé's Press Here. We made both of those books into full 55-minute musicals, and I love the absurdity of it. Like, there is nothing better than getting a phone call on the box office line being like, how are you going to make this show into a, this book into a musical <laughs> and to say, come and find out, but taking something abstract and putting that on stage and adding in a narrative that is in line with the author's intent is such an amazing and joyous challenge. Yeah. I, I bet at the end of that production, you, you know, there must have been this, this re relief. Hey, we did it. And then a, a sense of pride that, hey, we, we did it. You know, beautiful oops in particular, Barney was able to come and see the show and he loved it. And he's good friends with author Peggy Rathman, who wrote Goodnight Gorilla, of course. And he told Peggy, you know, hey, these folks over at Bay Area Children's Theater, they're doing something interesting. So we were able to create the very first musical adaptation of Goodnight Gorilla. And Peggy came to see the show. Oh, my God, I'll, I'll never forget forget this. And she looks at me at the end of the show. She says, I can die now. I mean, <laughs> she was so happy. It was so beautiful to watch. And that was what we call theater for the very young. So it was a show designed for kids ages one to four. 
So super interactive. The kids became the animals as part of the show. We had、uh, when they everyone went into went to sleep. They all we used a sheet as a parachute, so the kids are running in and out and then falling asleep with the actors. So it was a super interactive show, also. Oh, wonderful.、Uh, what's the, for for a parent listening out there who has that kid with a lot of extra energy? And they're thinking to themselves, you know, I really like the theater, but boy, I couldn't take my kid to see a, a, a Broadway show. There, there, there'd be, you know, we get thrown out.、Um, what can you say to, to to that family to to let them know that it's okay to bring that child to children's theater? I would say that children's theater. The way Bay Area Children's Theater does it, as well as TYA, that means Theater for Young Audience, companies across the country, we are child-focused arts organizations. Which means I have never had an expectation that our audience will be quiet. I've never created a show with an expectation that an audience will sit still the entire show, because that's not developmentally appropriate. So we are looking to create musicals and theater theatrical experience that are interactive, that are immersive, where the child feels that the show is for them. And yes, we want that parent laughing and watching and enjoying with them. But the experience is about what will entertain, what will provoke interesting thoughts, what's gonna in that's gonna instigate that that creative imagination for the child. So we get that question a lot, and the answer usually is, "Come and try us out. It's okay if they can't sit through it." And then, of course, we get the phone call afterwards. My child sat absolutely <laughs> fixed for the whole show. <laughs> yeah. Hey, tell us,、uh, talk a little bit about what's the difference,、uh, especially nowadays, because kids are doing what you and I are doing. We're sitting in front of screens, and so kids are sitting in front of the big giant TV screen in the living room, or in front of their tiny phone device, or in front of their their laptop to to go to school. What's the difference between a kid experiencing story through a screen, or at a th- movie theater? And then at a live children's theater. I love this question so much. <laughs> After a year of not being able to do the live event, and I know I'm sure you you'll understand this answer. A live event has a special magic to it because it is not a one way conversation. It is a two way conversation. It is the actors to the audience and the audience to the actors. And when you have that audience actor collaboration, and they meet in the middle, it is truly a magnificent thing to experience because it's like the energies—it's not doubling; it's 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 exponentially bigger. And you can't do that with a screen. I mean, all all the props to the incredible artists who are making. Wonderful shows for screens right now. There's really, I mean, I'm I'm thrilled with some of the new children's programming that's coming out for you know m- different kinds of media. But there is something unique and specific about、mm-hmm. being in a room live with a child,、mm-hmm. and、uh, I don't think you can replicate it on a screen. I just don't. I, I certainly haven't been able to do it. I, you know, as you were mentioning that, I recall.、Um, uh, Seven or eight years ago, we had an,、uh, we, we hosted international kids here in our home, and we had a young woman from Italy, and, and she had an opportunity to come out on tour with my daughter and I, and we toured for three weeks. We were down down south, and it was a, two or three schools a day, and, and just bouncing from state to state. And at the end of the third week, the Italian student turned to me and she said. I don't understand. Every show, it's different. If you've, you've done all these shows, I've never seen you do the same show twice. How do you do it? It's crazy, and I never thought of it. But it's true, you know. Every, even if you're doing the same, and in my case, the same magic trick, and I'm sure for you, the same song, you're doing the same song. A different audience, it's presented differently. And I, I even use the example, you know.、Um, I have a levitation illusion, and when I'm int- if I'm levitating a first grader, I introduce that to the audience in a much different way than if I'm levitating an eighth grader. 
with the first grader, it's, hey, this is going to be fun. It's like floating in the air. And with the eighth grader, it's like, ah, you might die. And because both audiences respond differently, they want something something different. They're 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 different audience. An audience is like a living being almost. Yes, an audience. It, they do. It, it becomes a singular living being. And you know, we have been performed during the week. We do student matinees, which are audiences of almost all kids with teachers. And then on the weekends, we're performing with more of a co-viewing experience, where it's a parent next to the child. And we prep the actors and the stage manager who's, you know, calling all of our cues and all of that to know that the, the laughs are going to be different. The laugh lines are not the same because on the weekends, the child is taking their cue of what's funny from the parent sitting next to them. And on the weekdays, the child is taking their cue from their peers. And both are valid and both are wonderful. But it is different. Mm -hmm. And like being attuned to that and it, your example of an eighth grader versus a first, first grader. Absolutely. I mean, the kinds of shows we perform for three to six year olds are very different than those that we perform for fourth, fifth, sixth graders mm -hmm. because they're ready developmentally for a different kind of storytelling. Yeah. What can a. Uh... You know, I'm, I know, no parents are listening out there and they go, wow, great. I'd love to go to Nina's theater. It looks like it, would, it sounds like it would be a great experience. But I'm thinking that there's a lot of tips that, 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 that you have developed, a lot of skills, you know, creative muscles that, that you've developed over the years and that, that a parent might be able to use to kind of make their parenting a little bit more fun, a little bit more creative. Can you, can you share some of those? Absolutely. So now I am a mom of three kids. I've got a 12 year old, a nine year old and a five year old. And I've been working in children's theater my whole career. I've started my career as an actor, as a teaching artist. And over just the last couple of years, I have recognized and realized that folks like myself, folks like you who have this toolkit of performance, this toolkit of creative energy and creative games in our back pocket, we have this thing that we can bring to our parenting that a lot of other adults don't. So I um, have a whole world that I'm trying to get out there around creative parenting to encourage parents to use story, to use imagination, to use creativity to make parenting joyous and also to make those really hard moments a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Absolutely. So creative parenting is a mindset. It's not a skill set. You know, so this isn't we're going to go and do 15 different craft activities today. It is really more about thinking along the lines of how can I infuse creativity into my life and into my kid's life every moment of every day. And, and we're not, I'm not talking about huge things. I'm talking about you wake up in the morning and it's breakfast time and you decide to ask your child, hey, you know, if you could be any character from a story, who would you be and why? Or your child comes home from school and they're in a bad mood and it's it's been rough and you say, hey, what, what's going on? And they don't have the words to express it. Maybe you put on a song and you say, hey, what does your anger look like in your body? Can you show that to me? Or maybe you get out markers and you say, can you draw your anger? Because I, I see it. I see that you're having a rough time right now. So giving kids the opportunity to use the arts and use creative thinking to express their emotions. Um, and then another huge element of this is letting go of perfection. You, you as a performer know that a creative process by its very nature <laughs> is unpredictable and you cannot control it. Mm -hmm. And we as parents are being inundated with images of perfection on social media. I love me some social media, but it's really hard. And adding an element of, you know, we're playing today. Play doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. Uh you know, as you're, as you're saying that, I'm thinking that 
you know, that one of the things that that Italian student noticed was my ability to just kind of roll with the punches and understand going in. I'm starting a show and I have a, a, a starting point and I know that I want to get to this point over here to end. But I also understand that getting from here to there, there's going to be some zigs and zags and because I'm using kids and I don't know what they're going to say. And, uh, you know, if a kid comes up and I'm expecting them to say blue and they say red instead, I can't sit there and pull my hair out. I have to be able to go with it. And I think that's as parents, we need to be able to do that, too. Absolutely. And, you know, I think about what we are going to need for tomorrow's thinkers. Like, how are the, this current generation of kids going to grow up to become amazing leaders and amazing innovators? And it's exactly what you just described. It's a process. It's, it's the ability to, to, to learn from the environment around you, to have a vision, but know that the process itself is going to change and modify as you go. That is the creative process. And if we don't teach our kids that process, how are they going to learn it? They're just going to get out there in the job market and, you know, all these big companies are going to be saying, we're looking for collaborators. We're looking for innovators. Well, that's something you can start teaching when they're three years old, when they're four years old. And it, the hardest part is actually making sure that the adult remembers that they already have these tools. Mm. They are already creative. It's just we've spent a lifetime often pushing that down and trying to control and giving ourselves labels like, oh, I can't draw. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You sure? Yeah. I, I mean, you can take a pen and you can put it on the paper. Mm-hmm. You can draw. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, you know, I like what you said earlier about parenting. It's really important for parents to let go of perfection, that, that we're not perfect and I know for myself, some of my, absolutely some of my most memorable uh, moments on stage came from mistakes, Uh, you know, things that were absolutely out of my control. And instead of freaking out when they happen, kind of embracing it and and going with it. And I think the same as as I look back on, on parenting and I think I did a pretty good job. My kids now are 25 and 28, and they're pretty good people, and I think I had something a little bit to do with it anyways. Um, yeah, just being able to roll with, with, with the punches and when being able to say to your kids, yeah, that wasn't my best moment. I'm sorry. Let's see if we can we can uh, do this better. I love that. You know, in, in my family and, and in my shows, we'll, talk, we'll call those happy accidents. Mm-hmm. You know, something goes wrong. You got to roll with it. You got to figure it out. And I mean, that was one of the reasons I love doing Beautiful Oops. The whole point of that book and that show was every mistake is an opportunity to make something beautiful. And the more that we can embrace that as adults and then allow our children the freedom to explore and the freedom to fail... We're growing resilience and we're growing creativity. And that's just, to me, that's such a critical, critical skill. Uh, Amen. That is something that we've talked about a lot here on the podcast, that there there are so many parents out there that seem determined to bubble wrap their kid so that they don't experience any kind of disappointment, any scraped knees, any any kind of sadness, and A, it's not realistic, you, you can't do that, and B, it's not healthy, and we can, we, we learn a lot, and, you know, I, and I'm not saying that everybody just needs to pull, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that's, you know, but yeah, we have to be able to teach kids that, uh, hey, you fall down, let's, let's get you back up, let's, Try that again. You can you can do it. You have the strength to do it. And I think play and and, in failing create creatively, it's a a really kind of safe way to to start to develop those skills. I would completely agree. I mean, if you're, you know, playing a story game and just doing a adult starts once upon a time, there was a and let the child fill in gorilla and the gorilla went to let the child fill in Disneyland. What is happening in that moment is actually the child is teaching themselves that they have the power to make a story, to create a world. 
and the adult is watching their child succeed. Yeah. So that that desire to bubble wrap, you can slowly back away from it because you, if you're working in that creative mindset, you're going to watch your child develop that independence, develop their own sense of self. So you know that they will be okay. And yeah, they are going to fall and they are going to scrape their knee and they are going to get up again. Mm hmm. And it'll be okay. Yeah, yeah. I love that sense of empowerment that a kid gets when you ask that question, whether it's in a, in a creative uh, kind of stage theater game or when you're asking a kid looking at a picture, what do you think will happen next? What do you think about this or that? Asking those those questions where you are saying, hey, I want to know what you're thinking. I value your opinion. I think that's just incredibly empowering. I totally agree. And just in the world of your podcast specifically and reading with your kids, every time you're opening a book with your child, there are so many different creative modalities you can be looking at as you're reading that book. There's guess what happens next in the story. There's let's look at these illustrations. What colors are in these illustrations? How do they make you feel? Why do you think the illustrator used these these colors? There's, hey, can you put your body in the shape of this character? What what did that character look like if you were to get up and move like that character? Right. So these are all like easy, tiny little things. They don't have to be big, right? It can be small little moments. And those small little moments are the same exact thing that we were talking about earlier. Actor to audience, energy, right? It's the same thing. Parent to child, creative energy, happiness, connection. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I can't think of a better way to to end our conversation. That's a really, really powerful message. Uh, Nina, tell everybody where they can find out more um, about the Bay Area Children's Theater and also more about you and your, your thoughts on creative parenting. So Bay Area Children's Theater, you can find us at BACtheater.org. And we currently have a product that actually ships nationwide that's an audio musical. So you don't have to be in the San Francisco Bay Area. And for creative parenting, you can find me at creativeparenting.net and on Instagram at nmehan. Excellent. We've had a great time talking Talking about a lot of great, fun, creative things with our guest, Nina Meehan. Nina, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much. This has been super fun. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Holly Goldberg Sloan. She'll be here to celebrate the elephant in the room. If you're the author of a fantastic children's book, we would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Being a guest, it's fun. It's easy. It gives you the opportunity to tell thousands of people about your fantastic book. And it doesn't cost a thing. No need to pay anybody to facilitate your visit to the show. All you need to do is to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. Scroll on down to where it says Be a Guest. Want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, want to start by thanking our guest, Nina Meehan, founder of the Bay Area Children's Theater. Also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Helen Fraser, Justina Thompson. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank Audie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. But most of all, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always... Thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.